always new gadgets. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, many people are afraid to read the book of Revelation. They seem to think that it's too complicated and some people think it's too scary. And I suppose if you don't know the Lord as your Saviour, it is. Because it warns us about some very terrible things that are going to happen in the last days. And... uh, I find as I read the Word of God, as a believer in the Lord Jesus, it's a great blessing. In fact, the book of Revelation promises a blessing to all those who read and understand it. And I think it would be good for us this morning just to take a look at the book and take an overview. There's 22 chapters. We're going to do 22 chapters this morning. So you better get ready but you'll still be home for lunch. We'll read from verse 1 of chapter 1. We'll read the whole chapter. It's a lovely chapter. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and to his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the pups with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and the voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and of death. 
write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Heavenly Father, just bless us as we meditate in your word this morning. Give us a clear understanding of what you would have us know today. Lord, we're living in the last days. We realize the time is short. Help us to be watching. Help us to be waiting. Help us to be working. And Lord, we just ask that you will give us that understanding heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of the Revelation is a wonderful book. How do I get this on? And uh, the Bible tells us the key. Here we have the key. In chapter 1, verse 19, we've just read it. Verse 19, it says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Three things that John was told to write. If we go back a little bit at the beginning of the um, uh, chapter, uh, we read there in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, I know that when millennialists interpret the book of Revelation, they tell us that it's all about the revelation of the person of the Lord Jesus. And we've read about that revelation in chapter 1 today, but the book of Revelation is not about revealing the person of the Lord Jesus. It's about revealing things which must shortly come to pass. The revelation that Jesus has was given to him by the Father and he has passed it on to John for the churches. And so we have the truth of the future that God has for this world. You know, God knows the future. (laughs) Nobody else does. God has foreknowledge. And uh, all of the religions of the world uh, can guess and they can speculate, but only God knows what's going to happen in the future because God controls the future. And so the book of Revelation gives us an outline from the time of John right down uh, to the end of the age and right into eternity. It's an overview of the whole of future history. And we're just going to do a quick run through on that today. And I hope that it'll be helpful to you and help you with the understanding of this. The three, three sections in the book. Firstly, in verse 19, we read, uh, write the things which thou hast seen. We've already read that. We saw what John saw. We saw that wonderful vision of the Lord Jesus amidst the seven golden candlesticks. And what a wonderful view that is of him. He's the first and the last. He's, he's, the, uh, he's the, the, the one who has risen from the dead. And this vision must have been something very precious to the Apostle John. But you must remember that about 60 years before, he had stood on Mount of Olives. He had watched the Lord Jesus ascend up to heaven. And he saw him disappear in a cloud. And for 60 years, he had never seen the Lord Jesus. And yet he still was preaching the truth. And... Here he comes in on this day, on the Lord's Day, on the Isle of Patmos as a prisoner, as in exile, and the Lord Jesus appears to him again and he sees the same Lord Jesus that he walked with in the years on earth. And so we have that vision of the Lord Jesus here in chapter 1. The second part of this uh, great book is the things which are. In the chapters 2 and 3, we have, let me see if I can work this thing, here we are. In chapters 2 and 3, uh, we have seven letters to seven churches. 
And these are the things which are in this present church age. Uh, we have a message to each of the churches. Uh, in every church, God commends them, but he also reprimands them, and he promises blessing to those who are the overcomers. Throughout these seven letters to the seven churches, uh, we find the Lord addressing certain people in each of these churches. They are the overcomers. We read, To him that overcometh, in verse 7, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Verse 11, He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And so on right through to each of the churches. Now, overcomers in this context, in this scripture, is not a victorious Christian. It's not the super-duper Christian who's just living the wonderful victorious life, riding the top of the waves all the time. This is simply Bible-believing, Bible born-again believers. The overcomer is a saved person. And within each of these seven churches, professing churches in Asia Minor, there were certain people who were saved and certain people who were not saved. And that's the case in Christendom and churches everywhere. Just because people go to church doesn't mean to say they're saved. And uh, when a person uh, becomes an overcomer, that means they become born again. If you want to know John's interpretation of the overcomer in his epistle, he says, who is he that, is, uh, who, who is he that overcometh? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And he says, and whosoever is born of God overcomer. So John uses the terminology of overcomer as an equivalent to being saved. And within the uh, seven churches there are a saved remnant and those are the ones that know Jesus Christ personally as their personal saviour. And so the seven letters are referring to seven churches that existed in Asia Minor in John's day but they also are prophetic. Each one of these is a stage of Christendom from the day of the church being established at Pentecost right down to the end of the church age to the rapture of the church. And if we had time today, we would go through church history and just show you how that works out exactly as prophesied here in the Word of God. We start with the church at Ephesus uh, which was the representative of the early church in the first century. We come to Smyr uh, Smyrna, uh, which was the suffering church during the pagan persecutions, the ten pagan persecutions. The scripture says you know, they would have tribulation ten days. And so they had ten days, ten periods of great persecution under Roman emperors. And then we come to the Pergamos, uh, a church which means married and the church became married to the state uh, under Constantine. And um, it was a, a union of uh, apostasy uh, and with the, the, the church. And uh, then we come to Thyatira, which of course is the Roman Catholic Church from 600 uh, AD, AD. And um, we, get, we, we won't go into the details there, but it's the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Thyatira. And then Sardis, the Reformation Church, has a name to live, but it's dead. And the Lord says, be watchful, strengthen the things that remain, that are ready to die, for I have found thy not found thy works perfect before God. So we have the Protestantism as Sardis, and uh, there's a great deal of wonderful similarities there with Protestantism today. Then we come to Philadelphia, the brotherly love church uh, from the 1700s. Uh, with the great revivals in the Moravian revival and the Wesleyan and uh, other revivals that took place. The gospel went out into all the world and uh, the Lord says to them, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. And uh, so the Lord did. The British Empire opened the doors to the gospel to go into all the world and the Philadelphia church represents that era. And there's still some Philadelphia churches around the day still with the open door, preaching the gospel. Then the last stage is, of course, Laodicea. Laodicea, the church that just says, I am rich and increase with goods, have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's the church 
in the last days. That's Christendom today. The church has gone for finance. The church has gone for big money. The church has gone for the prosperity gospel. And that is the church at Laodicea, the final stage of Christendom in this church age. So we have come to the end of the church age. And the next stage is the rapture of the church. And in chapter 4 we read, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, saying, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. John sees a door open in heaven, and he sees, uh, hears this voice. It's a command. Come up hither. And every believer is going to hear that at the rapture. The trump Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. <coughs> and so the door open in heaven is open for us to enter. The Lord Jesus will come into the sky and will be caught up together with those who have died before into his presence. When we come to uh, chapters, uh, four, uh, chapters 4 and 5, we have the rapture and in heaven the church... Um, I should have switched that. Pardon me, I'm a bit slow today. Uh, we just take a, a, an overview of the, the whole book as a whole so that you see the thing in, in context. Um, chapters 1, chapter... Oops, whoops, I've pressed the wrong thing. What have I done? I've done something wrong, brother. There, yeah, well, thanks. Um, uh, That's it, that's it. Yeah. Patmos. Oops, we've got to come back. Uh, chapter 1 is the vision on Patmos. Chapter 2, the seven letters to the seven churches. Chapters 2 and 3. And uh, then the door is opened in heaven. Chapter 4. And in chapter 4 and 5, John enters heaven. And he sees the 24 elders worshipping, leading the worship in heaven. And uh, I know that some commentators will tell us that uh, the 24 elders are the 12 apostles and the 12 patriarchs or something, but the Bible tells us who they are. If you go back to 1, 1 Chronicles chapter 24, you'll find 24 names there, 24 elders in Israel. And uh, they are the ones that were leading the worship in the temple, in the and, there. and they've, been they've been raised with Christ when Christ rose from the dead. Uh, the bodies of the saints which slept arose and they all were rose and they are in heaven now and they are leading the worship in heaven. And um, so in heaven when John gets there he sees uh, a roll of a book and uh, the roll has uh, seven seals and the roll is closed up. And he weeps because there's nobody worthy to open the book. And then somebody comes and says, ah, but somebody has been found. It's the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. He's worthy to open the book. Well, this book is a book of judgment. And this, these seals, each one of them, releases judgments upon the earth. And these are going to be released after the rapture upon the earth in a period of seven years. Seven seals. The number seven appears time and time and time again through the book of Revelation, more than any other book in the, in the Bible. And uh, so he sees this book that is sealed. And the Lord Jesus is the one who is worthy to break the seals. Why is that? Because the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. The Lord Jesus is the only one who can judge. At the great white throne, it's going to be the Lord Jesus who sits upon that great white throne. Why is it? Because he has taken the judgment of all our sin and therefore he's the only one that's worthy to pass any judgment on sinners. And so the Lord Jesus uh, takes the book and he begins to open the seals. And throughout this, uh, this uh, wonderful book, uh, we have the... Uh, 
uh, first three and a half years, we have seven, the seals begin to get opened. And when the seventh seal comes, it releases seven trumpets. So in the first half of the seven years of great tribulation, in Daniel chapter, <coughs> Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 20, uh, 27, it tells us that uh, it's seven years. And so the, the period is seven years. And Revelation indicates that this is three and a half years. And when there are seven seal judgments, the seventh one is seven trumpets. And that's in chapters 6 to, to 9. Then we have from chapter 10 to 14, which deals with all the events that take place at the midpoint of the seven years. And then chapters 15 to 18, we have events taking place in the second half of the tribulation. So it's all very chronological. The seventh seal is the seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet is the seven vials. So therefore it's chronological. Some people have thought that these were parallel visions, but they're not. They're continuous. They are sequential. And so uh, the seven seals reveal uh, and, and turn to the seven trumpets in chapter 6 and chapter 9. Now, what are these seals? In chapter 6, we have details about the seals. First of all, there is going to be a rider upon a white horse, and this rider on the white horse has a bow, but he has no arrows. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer. The first thing that will happen, as we read in other scriptures, when the rapture takes place, there is going to be a antichrist who will appear. He will come as a great peacemaker. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just after Paul speaks about the rapture, he says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And he says, When they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So the first thing that happens after the rapture is a peace move. And this is going to happen, the Bible tells us, that Antichrist, when he first appears, is going to have a seven-year treaty, confirm a seven-year treaty with Israel. And that, of course, is going to allow them to build the temple to the, the, in, in Jerusalem on the, on the Temple Mount. And uh, that's going to cause a lot of trouble with the, with the Muslims, of course, and Israel will know all about it. So uh, the, the uh, seals begin with a peace move, but then it says sudden destruction cometh. And then the next seal is peace is taken from the earth. One quarter of the earth will perish. And uh, then there's going to be famines in, and uh, then there's going to be, uh, a f in verse 8, a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and with beasts of the earth. And persecution, uh, verse 9, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cry out for vengeance before God. And then the sixth seal is a great earthquake. Uh, this earthquake is a global earthquake and uh, it's, um, there's warfare um, and uh, the kings of the earth uh, will cry out uh, to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand in verse 17. These six, first six seals introduce the Great Tribulation. I believe that these seals will be the uh, Islamic terrorism. <coughs> I believe that the sixth seal is the Russian invasion of Israel. The reason for saying that is that Russia must um, 
uh, must invade Israel in the first half of the tribulation. And the reason for saying that is that Israel has to get converted in the tribulation. And they have to be converted by the midpoint of the tribulation. When we come to chapter 12, which is at the midpoint uh, of the tribulation, uh, you'll find that it speaks of the Israel as those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So halfway through the tribulation, the Jews have to be God's witness. In the first half, there's 144,000 who go preaching the gospel of the kingdom in all the world for a witness to all nations, Matthew 24, 15. So Israel becomes God's witness and in the first half, through the preaching of 144,000, the nation will turn to Christ. Two-thirds will perish, but one-third will survive and they will seek the Lord with all their heart. And God will pour out his spirit upon the nation of Israel in that first half of the Great Tribulation. Because halfway through, they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And therefore, in this first half, we have the seal judgments. And I believe that this is the time when Israel repents and Russia invades because we know that when Russia invades, Ezekiel chapter 39 says that the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. When will Israel be converted? When Russia invades and from that day and forward Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God and the verses that follow indicate that they come into the new covenant of blessing with God. So we have the uh, first half of the tribulation beginning with the seals and this great earthquake which will shake the earth. And when Russia comes down, there's a great earthquake and it's universal, it's global. And therefore, I believe that's the time that the Russian invasion will take place and that Israel will turn to the Lord and the nations will cry out. Um, they'll say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come <coughs> and who shall be able to stand? Well, the um, seventh uh, of the um, seals is broken in chapter 8 and verse 1. And uh, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense and uh, he shall offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Uh, then in verse 7, we were in the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned, and all green grass was burned. This is the continuation of the judgments in the first half of the tribulation. Uh, there are two wars in the tribulation. There is a great war in the first half with Russia and Islam, Ezekiel 38, 39, Joel chapter 2, and they come down, Israel repents, and then there is a great war in the second half, at the end of the second half of the tribulation, which is the Battle of Armageddon, when Antichrist brings the armies of the world against redeemed Israel. And then Christ will come in glory and power. So there are two great wars and two great earthquakes. Firstly, in the... Sorry. Uh, uh, there's a great earthquake at the time of this invasion and the great earthquake at the time of Armageddon. Worldwide earthquake will shake this whole world before Jesus comes to reign. Uh, this is the, uh, the scenario that the scripture gives us um, at the time of the Russian invasion. Uh, we we're told which countries are going to join with it. Turkey, 
uh, Iran, and uh, Turkey is called Togama in the ancient times. Iran was called Persia. Libya, Ethiopia was, that's Sudan today because Ethiopia was the south of uh, Egypt in ancient times. And Russia, of course, is the land of Magog. And uh, they're going to come in and that's going to cause Israel uh, to turn to the Lord Jesus. You know, we see this today. Russia, Russia is in Syria today. Uh, sorry, this. Russia's in Syria today. Turkey's in Syria today. Iran is in Syria today. They're on the border of Israel. Hezbollah in the land of Lebanon is Iran's de facto army. And down here in the uh, Hamas is also armed by Iran. Uh, Israel is surrounded. And uh, in Iran, they have a clock uh, in one of the parks in, in the great big clock. And they've set the clock to, to, uh, to, to go down to the time when Israel will be destroyed. Just recently, they had blackouts and the clock stopped. I think the Lord might have had something to do with that. But uh, so Israel at the moment is surrounded by these various countries, all Islamic and all hating Israel. And the time's only not far off. And that's going to be in the first half of the tribulation. So we must be near the rapture. The rapture has to come first. And um, when... Russia comes down, God is going to answer when Israel turns to the Lord. Uh, Joel tells us uh, that uh, the northern army will be destroyed when Israel repents and uh, they'll be sent away to a northern land far off, barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. That's where they're going to end up. Why? Because Ezekiel chapter 39 verse 6 tells us that the land of Magog will be burned with fire. When Russia comes down, God will judge not only their armies on the mountains of Israel, only one-sixth of their army will escape, but God is going to also judge the land of Magog, which is Russia, and it'll be burned. They won't be able to return to their own land they'll have to go into Siberia where they've been sending their prisoners uh, for decades. And that, of course, is going to bring a great repentance on the part of the Muslim people. And if we had time, Isaiah chapter 19 spells out how the, the Egyptians are going to turn to the Lord in the tribulation. And Assyria is going to turn to the Lord. That's Iraq. And they're going to turn, there's going to be a highway from Assyria down to Egypt through Jerusalem uh, so they can come and worship the Lord in Jerusalem. There'll be an altar unto the Lord in the land of Egypt and the Lord will say, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, my, uh, my servants. So we, there's going to be blessing come out of that uh, in the Muslim nations. Islam will be smashed and so will communism in Russia uh, be smashed in that first half of the uh, tribulation when the uh, armies come down into Israel. When we come to the chapter 8, the trumpet judgments, uh, I, I think this is God's justice uh, on uh, uh, yes, uh, God's justice on the, um, the Greens. Uh, you know, one of the things that's dominating the world today is this whole talk about global warming. And uh, the Greens, their environmental emphasis is just ridiculous. And um, everything is seen in through, the, through the eyes of, 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 of the environment. You, you can't talk about anything, but you've got to relate it to the environment. And you know what? When the trumpet judgments come, God is going to burn one third of the trees, one third of the grass. It'll be one third of the crops. There's go this world, is God is going to show 
who's in charge of the weather. And he's going to darken the sun for one third of the day. You know, they think that they can control the weather. They can't control the weather. God controls the weather. He turns the rain on and he turns the rain off. We've got rain at the moment. We had droughts just a little while back. And God sends droughts uh, as an act of judgment upon nations when they turn away from him. And uh, so we have the, the uh, environmental judgments uh, that God will send in the trumpet judgments. Then the fifth of these is going to be a terrible judgment. The bottomless pit is going to be opened. You know, there are demons that God has locked up in the bottomless pit. And he's going to release those for a short season during the Great Tribulation. And for five months they're going to have power to torment men and to bite people like, like a some sort of like a locust or a, or a, a scorpion. And uh, men will seek death and won't be able to find it. They'll be in agony for five months as a result of these demons that will attack uh, men uh, in the Great Tribulation. And then the sixth of the trumpet judgments is going to be a great Asian war. We're told here about uh, an army of 200 million 200 million that will cause the death of one third of the world population. There's only one place in the world that you could have one third of the world population wiped out and that's in Asia. And uh, this is the great Asian war that's going to take place and beloved we see that all heading up right now with China. China is threatening the world and uh, everybody is saying an ex-general in the Australian Army said on the news a little while back that China will, invite, will attack America within five years. He's a military man. He commanded our troops in Afghanistan. He knows the situation. And beloved, we see Asia in ferment. China has just sent 50,000 of its troops to the border of India. They're in conflict there. They're building airfields there. They're, they're building bunkers for intercontinental ballistic missiles up on the Himalayas. Beloved, they're going full steam ahead uh, for war. The, Russia, the Chinese today have more ships than America. And under, under Obama, only half of America's planes could take off the, on the ground because he didn't give them the spare parts. If it wasn't for Mr. Trump coming, they wouldn't have been able to fly. So America wouldn't be prepared if it, somebody like Obama, and now that they have Biden there, well, America's defences will decline again. And so we have the Great Asian War, and we can see it all coming together. Japan is armed. Uh, Formosa is under threat. The Philippines is threatened, the South China Sea. And we can see all of the nations arming. Australia now is talking about spending $2 billion on missiles so that we can defend ourselves against China. People know that it's getting very close. And this great Asian war is going to take place in the first half of the Great Tribulation. Then we come to the midpoint. In the midpoint of the Tribulation, after the world has been devastated, just... To Think of this for a moment. In the first half, Russia and Islam will come down into Israel and God will destroy them. The land of Russia will be burned. The remnants of their army will go away to Siberia. Islam will turn to the Lord and then the great Asian war will take place and Asia will be decimated. One third of the world will perish. At the end of the first three and a half years, this world is going to be in a terrible state. Famine, pestilence, buildings that have collapsed with earthquakes. And people will be crying out for someone to help. And there's one country that hasn't been devastated. And that is Europe. That is the revived Roman Empire. That is Antichrist's kingdom. Why? 
aren't they devastated in the first half of the tribulation? I believe when Russia comes down, she's going to say to Europe, you keep out. Don't you defend Israel or we'll turn the gas off because Europe has 40% of its energy coming from Russia and it has other energy coming from Libya and from North Africa, from Muslim countries. And they can turn the gas off from Europe. And all they've got to do is to say to Europe, you keep out of this, this, this business with Israel and, uh, and, and, or else we'll just turn off the gas. And so they can blackmail Europe and Europe will have to stand aside and watch Israel being attacked and then we'll have to stand there and watch Asia destroying itself and the only nation that will be unaffected proportionately will be Europe and that's where Antichrist is. And so the world will look to Antichrist and say, come and help us. And so they're going, he's going to move in to the temple in Jerusalem and he's going to claim to be God. He's going to claim to solve the problem, provide the food. And I think the mark of the beast will be like a, a, a food ticket. Everybody will be crying out. They won't be able to buy or sell unless they receive the mark of the beast. Antichrist will have the world eating out of his hand. He's the only one that will be able to do anything for them. And the world will have nobody else to turn to. And so, dear friends, uh, the temple in Jerusalem will be where Antichrist will set up his throne and he'll drive the Jews out of Jerusalem. They'll come back, but still he drives them out and he causes the Jewish sacrifices to cease in Jerusalem. At the end of this time, we have the second half of the tribulation and we have the seven vile judgments. The seven vile judgments are directed by God against Antichrist, against the beast and his kingdom. The first ones are general, but in the second half, the vile judgments are directed specifically against the, the Antichrist's kingdom. And because he has set himself up in opposition to God in the temple of Jerusalem, and he is uh, claiming to be God, and God is going to focus his judgments on Antichrist and all those who follow him. And, uh, and so the, uh, the Antichrist will be judged in that second half. We won't go into the details of those uh, seven vile judgments. But at the end of that time, the Lord Jesus is going to come again. In the book of Zechariah, we read, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Now, I've got a picture of the Mount of Olives there. Uh, actually, I split the Mount of Olives on my computer. So, so if I can do it my, on my computer, the Lord can do it when he comes. And uh, his feet are going to stand upon that mount, overlooking Jerusalem and uh, he's going to deal with the Antichrist and his armies. Uh, they'll be slain by the sword that comes out of his mouth as he comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Chapter 19 tells us about this second advent. It says in verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Lord Jesus is going to come in glory and power. You know, friends, it's wonderful to think that that day is going to be the day of his glory. We look forward to that uh, 
time when we shall be with him and we caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But the world is not going to see the Lord Jesus at the rapture. It's going to be over in a split second, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as quick as you can blink. The rapture will be all over. The world won't see us go. It's going to be a, a silent, secret, very quick, instantaneous disappearance of people. One shall be taken, the other shall be left. But when he comes in glory and power, he's going to be seen in the heavens. Every eye shall see him. And if every eye sees him, I tend to feel the Lord is going to appear in the heavens for maybe a day or so. People on one side of the earth, it'll be night time. They're going to see him. The people on the other side of the earth, in daytime, they're going to see him. I think the Lord might circle the earth around the equator and come down over Bosra to the valley of Jehoshaphat where he'll slay the armies and the blood will run to the horses' bridles and the Lord will go up to the Mount of Olives and his feet shall stand there and the Mount of Olives is going to cleave. You know, that is a wonderful thing. When the Mount of Olives cleaves, there's going to be a river that will flow out from Jerusalem. You know, it's, it's amazing. The Bible is so, so wonderful. If you go to Jerusalem today, you go to Hezekiah's tunnel. You can walk through Hezekiah's tunnel and the water can surge up to your knees. It's an aquifer bubbling up out of the ground. And the Bible says that in the Millennial Kingdom, when the new temple is built uh, in the reign of Christ, that there's going to be a flow of water coming up from beside the altar in the temple and it's going to flow out through this valley down into the Dead Sea. And that Dead Sea, which is 1,200 feet below sea level, is going to have so much water come into it that it's going to be fresh water instead of salt water. And they're going to catch fish. And it says that they're going to catch them all the way up to Englaim. Englaim, I was wondering, where's Englaim? Well, in Glaim, the word means fountain of two calves. Do you remember how the Jeroboam had two calves? He had one in Dan, and he had one down, down here at Bethel, one at either end of his kingdom. Well, the water's going to rise all the way up there to, to in Glaim. There's going to be a big inland lake, and they're going to catch fish in that, in, in, uh, that, uh, that wonderful lake. So, that's going to be one of the things that will happen after the Lord returns. And then the Jews are going to come back to the land. You know, we read in Ezekiel chapter 39, this, this wonderful verse. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Every Jew on the face of the earth will be a saved Jew and every one will go back to the land. That's where God intended that they should be, back in the land and God is going to divide the land to the tribes just as he is described in Ezekiel chapter 48. So the, the place of the temple will be rebuilt here and it's going to be a wonderful temple. Uh, the description, the specification is given in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 42 and uh, you can read that there. It's all, all there in detail. The people will come in through one gate and go out the other gate or they'll come in one gate here and they'll go out the other gate there and the priests will serve in the inner court and uh, the prince um, will, will be enter through this gate and uh, the Lord Jesus is going to be here and present in his temple. Wonderful day in that millennial kingdom. For a thousand years, we read in Revelation chapter 20 that six times it says 1,000 years. You know, the amillennials say, oh, it's symbolic. You know, a thousand years is symbolic. I say, what's it symbolic of? Oh, well, it's symbolic of a long period of time. Yes, but what sort of a long period of time? Well, why, doesn't, why isn't it a thousand years? Of course it's a thousand years. Just believe the Bible, that's all. And then at the end of the thousand years, there's going to be a great white throne judgment. There's going to be a rebellion against God's people 
uh, Satan is going to be loosed out of his prison for a season. He's going to raise an army from Magog again and they're going to come up and camp, encompass the camp of the saints at Jerusalem. And, uh, but then there's going to be the earth burned with fire. Burned with fire. And there'll be no more sea. It'll be a new world entirely. A, to a new atmosphere, a new earth. And John sees the bride, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. If you look at those dimensions, they're pretty big. It's a, it's a big place. 1,500 Roman miles, 2,220 kilometers, the wall around it. And uh, that's from about Greece across to the Persian Gulf. It's from, from the Black Sea uh, down to the south of Egypt. That's how big it's going to be. There's no sea, of course, in that time. And the amazing thing about it is that there will always be the Jew, the Gentile, and the church. You know, in the new heavens and new earth, Israel will have 12 gates in the walls. And on each gate, the name of one of the tribes of the Israel. And there'll be an angel standing at each gate. And then the new Jerusalem itself is for the bride, the church. That's where we're going to be in the, in the new Jerusalem. Its foundations are the 12 names of the 12 apostles that are written in the foundation of the new Jerusalem. And so the Gentile nations here, they're going to occupy the new earth and they will come up into, uh, kings of the earth will bring their glory and honour into the new Jerusalem. So there'll always be Jew and Gentile in church. You know, the amillennialists want to con confuse the church with Israel. They say that Israel is the church and the church is Israel. It's not. Uh, the church is something unique. It's the bride of Christ. And uh, we'll be, after the rapture, we'll attend the marriage in heaven. And then when we come with him in glory and power, there'll be the uh, marriage supper of the Lamb on earth. And the Gentiles and the Jews will all be guests at that marriage supper of the Lamb. So, the Spirit and the Bride, the Bible ends in the book of Revelation with an invitation. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth come. And let him that is the first come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Oh, beloved, it's wonderful that God is inviting men, women, boys, girls to come. That word come is beautiful. Come, come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, come. It's an invitation to come. Who to? To the Lord Jesus, to him personally. And he's saying come, and the spirit and the bride say come, and he that hears says come. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You know, life at best is very brief, like the falling of a leaf, like the binding of a sheaf, be in time. Fleeting days are telling fast that the die will soon be cast and the fatal line be passed, be in time. When we look at the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches have just about run their course. The church age is finished. We're right at the end. The door is about to open in heaven. The rapture will take place. We'll hear the Lord shout. We'll be caught up. We're going to be with Christ. And then for seven years, seven years, there's going to be awful judgment on this world. And if you're not saved in this church age, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. One shall be taken and the other will be left. Surely that should make you think if you don't know Christ as your saviour, it ought to make you think, I've got to do something about it. The Lord could come at any moment. I believe the rapture could happen today. It could happen before I finish speaking today. Yeah. I can't see anything else in Scripture that needs to be fulfilled. They're, they're circling Israel right now. They're threatening to wipe out Israel right now. 
Asia is building up its armies ready for an awful Asiatic war. We're right at the end of the age and we need to be ready. Life at best is very brief. Be in time. Be in time. The rapture could be here at any time. If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Saviour, you'll be left behind for that terrible judgment that's going to come on this world. We've talked a little bit about it. We could say a great deal more, but time doesn't permit us. But we need to be ready. I'm glad at the age of 15, I realised that the rapture could happen. Back in 1948, all my, my dad used to preach the second coming. And we'd just seen Israel become a nation. Yeah. 1948, 14th of May. And Bible preachers were saying, Israel has to go back to the land. We're in the last days. The coming of the Lord is near. And I sought the Lord then because I was afraid that I might miss the rapture. But beloved, so much more has happened since. There's been Israeli-Arab wars and we've got the world in turmoil. We've got nuclear threats. We've got pestilence. Everything that, that Jesus said would happen is about all being prepared right now. This so-called pandemic is just a little warning from God of what's going to be like in the Great Tribulation. We need to be ready. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the warnings of your word. Thank you that you have revealed to us what lies ahead. And we thank you that we can be ready and know the peace of God that passes all understanding in a time when the world is in turmoil. Father, we pray that uh, if there's a one here this morning uh, that is not ready for the rapture, that they will seek you while there is time. Father, we pray for each believer. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be watching. Help us to be waiting. Help us to be working. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.